All right, now that we've gotten through the spine, now we're going to move on to the upper extremity. And so the beginning of the upper extremity is here is we're going to talk about the brachial plexus. Now really the purpose of this lecture is just to give you an overview of the brachial plexus. So you know it's its structure, the nerves that come off of it, because the way we do the upper extremity in this book is we go through each section of the upper extremity. So the shoulder region, the pectoral region, the arm, the elbow joint, the forearm, and the hand. And in each section we're going to go through the relevant muscles, osteology, nerves, and blood vessels, and clinical pearls in each section of the upper extremity. And so we, we just want you to know when we reference the nerves, we want to know, you want you to know what they are, where they're coming from, just to give you better appreciation for the spatial anatomy. So starting off, what is the brachial plexus? The brachial plexus is it's a major network of nerves that is located kind of in the shoulder pectoral region, just deep to the clavicle and some of these muscles in the shoulder area. And it originates from the ventral rami of the last four cervical spinal nerves. Now remember, the dorsal rami go innervate the back muscles in the skin. The ventral rami come off the cervical spinal nerves and form the brachial plexus. And it goes all the way through from C5 to the first thoracic spinal nerve. So the, ner the roots are C5 through T1. Um, and these nerves, they carry both um, somatic, efferent, so motor, motor innervation to the shoulder and upper extremity, and then they also carry... Um, afferent neuron fibers, so sensory fibers, so so sensory information from the shoulder and the upper limb, you know, to the, sp the spinal cord in the brain. And they really, the big thing to know is that it's the source of nerves that provide the majority of the innervation to the shoulder and all of the innervation to the upper limb. The brachial plexus is broken down into specific components, and so we'll start here with first the roots. And the roots here are labeled in this diagram with uh, Roman numerals. So you have C5 here and C6. And these form um, the upper trunk here. So you have the roots forming the trunk. Then you have the C7 root, which forms the middle trunk here. And then you have the C8 and the T1 roots, which form the lower trunk here. So you have the roots here. And then you have the trunks here. And then you have the upper formed by C5, C6, then you have the middle, and then you have the lower trunk. And the lower middle trunk is C7 root, lower, lower trunk is C8, T1. <clears throat> then off of each tr uh, trunk you have divisions, and it's easy to remember. You have three anterior divisions and three posterior divisions total in the brachial plexus. So we start here with the upper trunk. We have an anterior division and a posterior division going off going off the upper trunk. Then in the middle trunk we have an anterior division and a posterior division. Then on the lower trunk we have an anterior division and a posterior division. And then after we do the divisions we have the cords. Now we'll start with the posterior cord. And, the, and these one thing to note about these cords is they're named in relation to the axillary artery. And we'll show that um, better in a, in a diagram on a subsequent slide where we have, because the, the, this diagram doesn't have it, but you have the axillary artery running through the middle of here, kind of encased by the brachial plexus, especially the cords. So the posterior cord, it's named because it's posterior to the axillary artery, but also <clears throat> one thing that kind of can help you remember that is it's only formed by posterior divisions. No anterior divisions form the posterior cord, versus the lateral and medial cords are formed um, by anterior divisions, uh, by the anterior divisions. And so the medial cord is named because it's medial to the axillary artery, Lateral cord, again, named lateral because it's lateral to the axillary artery. So that's our cords. And then to finish us off, we have our terminal nerves. And these are some major nerves that innervate both the shoulder and um, the upper limb region. And we'll go through, in subsequent slides, we'll go through each of the terminal nerves. Um, <clears throat> again, here's your axillary artery. And this is kind of a cutaway of the shoulder pectoral region encased by the brachial plexus here and you can see the nerves coming off here and again the, the cords you know receive their namesake because of the, their relation to the axillary artery. One thing to note there's a connective tissue fascia or fibrous fascia that encloses the brachial plexus in this region here and it's an extension of the prevertebral and deep cervical fascia. So those two fascias kind of extend from the neck, and we'll talk more about those fascias in the neck uh, chapter, head and neck chapter, and they form this fibrous sheath that encases the brachial plexus. <clears throat> now this has some 
clinical relevance because it enables anesthesiologists to selectively anesthetize the upper extremity. So let's say you're doing a surgical procedure on you know either the arm or the hand, and you only want to, you don't want to have to put the patient through the risk of general anesthesia. Again, also you can make it more you, it makes it easier to make it an outpatient procedure so the patient can go home the same day. So in order to do that, it, the anesthesiologist takes advantage of this fibrous sheath that's in this region that surrounds the brachial plexus. And what that does is, is the anesthesiologist puts a needle in into that sheath um, under ultrasound guidance. And what that enables them to do is, is they put the, the anesthetic in here and this sheath encases it, keeps it around the brachial plexus, doesn't let it diffuse anywhere else. And so it maintains you know, selective anest uh, anesthesia of the brachial plexus. It also allows a higher um, proportion of the drug to be delivered versus if you gave it you know, through a gas or you know, injected into the bloodstream. It's a higher concentration of drug you know, selective anest uh, anesthesia of the brachial plexus. It also allows a higher um, proportion of the drug to be delivered versus if you gave it, you know, through a gas or, you know, injected into the bloodstream. So now we're going to go through the nerves of the brachial plexus, both the terminal nerves and the non-terminal nerves. So you have the ter these terminal nerves you're talking about. So again, you go through, you got your roots, you got your trunks, um, you got your divisions, and then you got your cords. And then you have your terminal nerves here coming off. And these nerves, they supply the motor innervation um, to the shoulder and to, the, and to all of the upper extremities, so the arm, the forearm, and the hand. So now we have, we have a nice table to go through each of these nerves. And one thing you should know here is that we provide kind of the, not every muscle that is necessarily innervated by these nerves, but it's all, it gives you an idea of what the basic function of this nerve is and how you can kind of put things together in your mind and compartmentalize these um, these structures and their function. So one thing to know is is the radial nerve is ex responsible for all the extensor muscles of the upper extremity. So here's here's the radial nerve. It's this large structure that comes off the posterior cord. So that's all the extensors, both in the arm and the forearm. Then you have the musculocutaneous and the median nerve, which does really the flexors of the arm and the forearm respectively. Um, and then you have the ulnar, which kind of goes into the hand and does a lot of the hand um, function. And then the axillary does the deltoid and teres minor. But just a way you can keep it straight, um, you know, if you're in the arm area, you know, if it's a posterior muscle, it's probably innervated by the radial nerve. If you're in the anterior area, it's probably innervated by, mus it's innervated by musculocutaneous. Same thing in the forearm. If it's in the flexor compartment or anterior compartment, it's probably innervated by median nerve. Helps you keep, it kind of cuts down on the memorization you need to do for um, the innervation of all these muscles. Because as you'll see, there's there's a lot of muscles in the upper extremity, especially the forearm. So just to go through these individually, so again, you have your musculocutaneous here, which is this kind of branch here. And these are just, they cut these off. It looks like they're twigs, but again, um, they're full nerves. And you can see that here in this diagram. And it comes off the lateral cord, as you can see here. Again, here in this diagram, here's your lateral cord here. Okay. And then you have your musculocutaneous nerve coming off right here. And then it pierces through this muscle in the arm called the coracobrachialis muscle. And again, we'll go over that in the arm section of the book. And then it travels down here on top of the brachialis muscle and innervates the flexor muscles of the arm. And then it actually, at the elbow joint, it actually terminates as a sensory nerve um, that provides some sensation in the, in the forearm region. And again, the main function is that it innervates the flexor muscles in the anterior compartment. So now you have the axillary nerve, which is the smaller of the two nerves coming off the posterior cord. The radial nerve is the big nerve. If you take a cadaver-based class, um, that can help you kind of identify these ner which one is which. Is The radial is almost always much larger than the axillary nerve. And then the axillary nerve comes through this space called the quadrangular space. And this is with the posterior circumflex humeral artery. And we'll go over this space more in detail in the shoulder uh, section of the book. But just to give you an idea, the axillary nerve, it comes out, and then it innervates the deltoid. And it also provides the teres minor, and it also provides some sensory innervation to the lateral aspect of the arm. Radial, again, it's responsible for all the extensor muscles of, of really the arm and the forearm. It comes off the posterior cord. So again, here, that big nerve coming off. Um, and as you can see here, it exits out by the triceps here, by the triceps muscle, and it wraps around the humerus here and then innervate it giving off its branches in this compartment and then it comes through the elbow and then again it goes through the posterior compartment of the forearm innervating 
um, the extensor muscles of the wrist and the fingers. You have the median nerve. Now this, now remember, the median nerve has contributions from both the medial and the lateral cords. So you have the lateral cord here, the medial cord here. Here's your median nerve. So you have extensions from both cords. That's the only nerve, the only terminal nerve that does that. Every other nerve only comes from one cord. So keep that in mind. And it does the forearm flexors, and then it also does some of the hand muscles. And so we'll trace it. So especially when you're looking at a diagram or in a cadaver, an easy way to find the median nerve. And th this really wants to serve as your landmark, if you're, you know, especially if you're in a cadaver lab, to help you find the different branches of the brachial plexus. Really, you want to start with the M. And so the M is formed by, or you can see it here, so you have the M kind of like this. And the one part of the M is your musculocutaneous. The more lower part or inferior part is uh, the ulnar nerve. And then the point of the M is the median nerve, which is, um, and then these, this is the two... Um, extensions of the lateral medial cord forming it. So you find your M, and that can help you find your musculocutaneous and ulnar nerve. And then at the point of the M, you have the median nerve, which travels down through the arm. It doesn't give off any innervation in the arm. It travels through the elbow, and then it goes into the forearm, where it innervates a lot of muscles in the forearm, comes down, and then terminates here in the hand, where it actually innervates a number of muscles that um, move the thumb. Lastly, we have the ulnar, the ulnar nerve, which is the uh, only terminal nerve of the medial cord. Um, comes off the, ul the medial cord there. Really, the big thing it's involved with is the intrinsic hand muscles. So again, here's your uh, M for the median nerve, and then you have your ulnar nerve here that kind of comes off that medial cord. It comes down like the medial side of the arm, the elbow, and the forearm. doesn't do any, any innervation in the arm, but in the forearm, it actually innervates a number of muscles um, both in the flexor and extensor compartment. Then it makes its way down into the hand where it does a lot of work. It does some sensory innervation in the hand, does a lot of the intrinsic muscles that move the fingers and the thumb. So now the non-terminal nerves. So these are nerves that aren't terminations of the cord. They can come off any region of the brachial plexus. And they these provide, these provide the majority of the somatic innervation of the shoulder. So these are more so nerves that innervate the shoulder, they're not really doing anything in the arm or the upper extremity. The upper extremity, you know, the arm, forearm, hand is more so from these terminal nerves. So this is a table that's in your book. Um, this lists all the terminal nerves, where they come from, and then again the major, not all the specific innervations of each one, but really the major, especially motor innervations of each, uh, each nerve. And then we'll go through each, each part of the table. So first we start with the dorsal scapular. So it comes off the C5 root. So we want to uh, label this here. That's our C5 root. And as you can see, in this diagram, it's listed as two rhomboid. But this little twig here, that is the dorsal scapular nerve. And the reason why it says that is because it innervates the rhomboid muscles, which are these pair of muscles we went over in the spine lecture in the back, and then the levator scapula muscle, which is responsible for elevating the scapula. And so if you were to knock out your C5 root or your dorsal scapular nerve, either one, you could lose elevation of your scapula because your levator scapula would become de-innervated. Next on the list we have the uh, suprascapular nerve which is this guy right here and this this suprascapular it comes from the C5 C6 roots um, and it comes off this upper trunk region here um, and then what it does is it innervates two muscles in the uh, the posterior shoulder region the supraspinatus and the infraspinatus these are both rotator cuff muscles and they um, on either side of the spine of the scapula here. And again, we'll go over more of this anatomy in the, in the shoulder and pectoral region uh, section of the book, but just to give you an idea of where that nerve is traveling. Um, the long thoracic nerve, so this comes off your C5, your C6, and your C7 roots. So you can see it here. Here's the branch from each root, and then it forms the nerve, which goes down here. And to give you a better idea here on the on this diagram here, so you have here's it's labeled. You have your long thoracic nerve coming down here, and it travels along the serratus anterior, which is the muscle um, that it that it innervates, and it's kind of it's a muscle. It's called the boxer's muscle. It stable kind of stabilizes the scapula against the thoracic cage. A small nerve to be aware of is the uh, subclavian nerve, and it, um, it's, it's labeled here. It could even be, it's, sometimes it's called the nerve to subclavius, the muscle it innervates. And this is a small muscle in the pectoral region that is responsible for elevating the clavicle. That comes off the superior trunk here. 
Then we have the, uh, we group the lateral pectoral and the medial pectoral. And the reason we would do that here is we want you to understand that these nerves are not named for the re their relationship in which they travel with in the body. So they're not medial and lateral to each other. They're named because the lateral pectoral comes off the lateral cord and the medial pectoral comes off the medial cord. And, but they innervate similar muscles. The pec ma they both innervate pec major um, and then medial pectoral will also innervate um, pectoralis minor. And what they do is they, so you have lateral pectoral, which comes off the, the cord, the lateral cord here. And then you have medial pectoral, which will come off of um, the medial cord here and travel both in the pectoral region to innervate um, pectoralis major here. Then you have these cutaneous nerves, but they're, again, they're nerves that come off, um, the, they both come off the medial cord. So that's, that's the way you can keep them straight. They both come off the medial cord. They're both named medial cutaneous nerve. And the one does cutaneous nerve of the arm, medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm. And it's pretty self-explanatory. The one does the skin of the medial arm and then the other one does the medial forearm. And one thing to know in anatomy, you know, in everyday life, you refer to the arm as the entire extremity. You may have noticed I'm making a distinction between the arm and the forearm. The arm is, is, is the region between the shoulder and the elbow, and then the forearm is the region from the elbow down and the wrist. Um, so that's your forearm, that's your arm. Even though in everyday life we call the entire thing your arm, it's important to know anatomically because you may see it written in other books or your lectures um, with school. Is there's a, there's a there's a distinction is that the the arm and the forearm are considered separate areas. The upper and lower subscapular nerves they both come from the posterior cord, and one thing to note here is that there is you can see the posterior cord here, and you have your upper subscap here and your lower subscap. Now one thing to note from proximal to distal is you have the upper subscapular, then you have the thoracodorsal nerve, which is another important non-terminal nerve. I think it's on the next slide. And then we have the lower uh, subscapular. So upper subscapular, thoracodorsal, and then lower subscapular, all on the posterior cord. And these, they both innervate this, uh, the same muscle. And as you can see here in the diagram, you have the subscapular nerves here. So they're traveling here and here. And the, it's pretty simple to remember. The upper subscapular does the superior portion of subscapularis muscle, and then the inferior portion does the, does the, or the lower subscapular does the inferior portion of subscapularis. The thoracodorsal nerve, again, here it is in between the upper and lower subscapular nerve, again, coming off that posterior cord, innervates the one muscle, the latissimus dorsi muscle. And then you can see it here. Now, in some texts, you may see it, like in this diagram here, it's referred to as the long subscapular. It's the same thing as the thoracodorsal. So if you haven't realized already that anatomy has um, several names for the same structure. There's, or there's several structures that have di several different names. And so what we're going to try to point out, you know, what the common names for, you know, that are for each structure, just so you can keep it straight. And again, this nerve comes down, as you can see here, it comes down off that posterior cord, innervates that latissimus dorsi muscle. And that uh, finishes our overview. We're not, in this, we're not gonna go over the lesions of the brachial plexus because in our opinion, those require a little bit more knowledge to fully understand those lesions. You gotta really know the anatomy of more the upper extremity, so the shoulder region, the, you know, the arm, the forearm, and especially the hand for some of those, like the hand of benediction, clunky's claw, those, those lesions, you really got to understand the full anatomy of the upper extremity. So that's why we leave those for their, either their respective sections or even all the way at the end in the hand lecture. Um, so if you're looking out for those lesions, that's where you can find them.